Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Once again, uh, welcome to Home Ties. In the studio with me here today is my better half and partner in crime, Nancy Repke, and uh, we are continuing our discussion on how our many moves and our experiences abroad have shaped and impacted our marriage. And we left off uh, last time we had i uh, been talking about our experiences living in small town, United States, Wisconsin, among uh, people who basically we understood where they were coming from. It was our culture, uh, our home for growing up. And then I received another invitation to serve a congregation in a completely different part of the country, in a very different cultural setting in the city of Huntsville, Alabama. So just to uh, set the stage here, Huntsville, Alabama is a city of about a metro area of maybe about a half a million people in the larger metro area. High tech areas where the space program was engineered with Werner von Braun and his German rocket scientists. And we received this uh, call and I would say we were definitely both intrigued uh, by it, to say the least. It's in uh, the state of Alabama, which is in the American South, which is a very different culture than the culture in the state of Wisconsin, which is in the North. Now, as we were weighing this decision, I don't think we got much pressure from our relatives one way or the other. Do you? Um, I guess they were thinking, well, it's at least in the same country. And my parents would travel about a month out of the year and go south. So that was a good thing. I think they were willing to stop in and see us on the way to Florida. And I had a sister living about five hours from there, and she'd been there for a few decades, well, a decade or so with her family. So I also could communicate with my sister and say, hey, what's up with this? And oh, we might see each other for Thanksgiving or Christmas. That would be nice. Yeah, your sister lived in uh, the Knoxville, Tennessee area, which is about a five-hour drive away from Huntsville. So, yeah, again, I don't think we had much pressure uh, that we picked up on from our relatives that, oh, you have to stay close to us after having spent so many years overseas. But when I made my announcement to the congregation that I was leaving, uh, there were definitely a few shocked people within the congregation. Maybe they thought that, you know, how could we leave uh, once we finally got back to where we came from? And, yeah, you said it was uh, in the same country, same time zone as well. That was good. That's a good thing. <laughs> and uh, once again, we moved in two stages, uh, as we have done many other times. We also were homeowners once again. And we found ourselves in a school district that was sprawling. And in fact, on either side of our subdivision, there were two elementary schools for two different school districts. But our school district was zoned about 10 miles away. So that translated to maybe about a 20 to 30 minute drive uh, to school with our kids, depending on the traffic. Finding time for each other during that time of our life was a challenge, I think, because again, as the kids get older and got in more and more involved in their school programs and their homework and the work of the church, as so many married couples in that period of your life, we were in our 40s by that time. Um, I think it was also a challenge for me to take a vacation uh, because there really weren't any other congregations of our fellowship within near driving distance. So trying to get away on a Sunday meant leaving the worship service in the hands of lay leaders or 
trying to get a retired pastor to come in and fill in sometimes. Or we lived in Huntsville, Alabama for nine years, and that's the longest we have lived at any address. Um, how would you describe the, the culture of, of Huntsville, Alabama, and that community? Well, I always looked at it as being New South because it was a community that was built on a lot of people moving in, the military or some technology jobs, and it was booming. And there was even some recession. The recession was happening, but it didn't feel the effects of it right away. And also, eventually, the kids, they were at school, and I was at work, and that's probably where we had more the interaction with kids that had grown up there and more of the southern roots. But again, it was like a new south type feel. Yeah, in North Alabama, there were many transplants from other parts of the United States, from the Washington, D.C. area, for example, because they had... Uh, closed some military bases and moved the jobs there. St. Louis, there were a lot of people from that area as well as from the upper Midwest, Wisconsin, of course, Minnesota, um, and Michigan. But, of course, what that meant was whenever the holidays came, everybody head for the exits, right? That's true. But we had our family, and sometimes people came down from the north during the winter and my family definitely I saw them a lot at Easter because that was a nice time to travel at the end of their winter they would come down to the south mm -hmm. uh, the other, another thing about the dynamic of that community is there certainly a lot of turnover people coming in and doing contracts for maybe two or three years and then and then moving away so we saw that was reflected of course in the membership of the church as well and uh, the majority of members of that congregation we served at were not from the immediate community. So in some sense, I guess we were all kind of uh, foreigners trying to find our way and to make our own uh, culture there. And the church itself was a smaller church than the one I had been in in Wisconsin, um, about 120 members or so. And of course, there are some great blessings when you have a smaller congregation. Um, people really treat each other more like a family, and you really get into to know people on a really personal level. Um, there's also some challenges that go with having uh, smaller congregations as well. We also, at that time, were able to sponsor a few marriage retreats, which was, uh, again, a blessing for, as far as we're talking about, the effect on our marriage. That was a great thing. Make a plug for uh, Wells uh, marriage retreats. What would you say? What is your takeaway from going to marriage retreats? Um, it was really a good thing um, to encourage ourselves, and then also to interact with other people who also were doing focus on their marriage. The leaders of the retreat were just encouraging. We'd been to a few other ones, so to have it ourselves and to bring it, you know, south because. Some of the places we've been, Wisconsin or even Florida, but you know, to have it more in Alabama, Tennessee, got to know some more people and people with kids. So that was a good thing. And again, with the marriage retreat, it's not just about finding some time away from the kids and the work to be with, to reconnect with your spouse. It, these marriage retreats were also linked explicitly to God's word and directing people back to the scriptures for guidance and advice and really the strength to remain committed uh, as you go through life and come across all the different challenges that you face. Um, you know, honestly, I can say that if it was only the retreats that, was, uh, that we had done to help us with our marriage, then our marriage would have been over a long time ago. Uh, a thing that has really helped us more than that has been our practice of every day reading from scripture, either a daily devotional or some uh, some spiritual book, um, whether it's on a, a marriage topic specifically or on some other uh, devotional topic. That has been a, a huge thing for our marriage.
knowledge, and I really appreciate that you're willing to uh, do keep that up with me over all these years. I think it's been a it's been a great thing. It's been a vital thing for our marriage. Yeah, I think we both look forward to it and plan it in the morning. And if it somehow doesn't work, oh, we take another time. Huntsville is also a, uh, an international had its international community. Uh, once again, you found a job teaching English. No surprise. Uh, working with uh, immigrants in that community uh, for about eight years. And do you want to describe what that was like? Well, unlike Wisconsin, which was primarily helping Spanish speakers live in a community, now it was in Huntsville. And really, there could be eight to 12 languages that would be spoken in a classroom. But because you have a group of people, let's say 25 people that speak all different languages, it was showing the importance of using English and practicing English because, you know, they didn't just rely on one other language to communicate in the community. They could, you know, cross over and somebody from Iran could talk to someone from somewhere else. <laughs> and amongst the different nationalities that were passed through your classroom over the years, you did have some students from West Africa, I believe. Yeah, I did. Nigeria and Togo. Mm -hmm. And there was also an African food store in Huntsville that you visited. Yeah, there was. And when we hosted um, students from Belize, the Caribbean, it was marketed as an African Caribbean store. So kind of in the habit of going there and making some food with the students who came and then got to know yeah, the shopkeeper who was a sister of one of my class members. Yeah, you mentioned hosting uh, exchange students from uh, Belize, since we also hosted exchange students from other places as well. Yeah, the Balkans. And then there was also an Arabic food store that we would go for that and catch up on some foods that we even found Bulgarian cheese at in Huntsville, which was actually the first time to find that in the United States at a store. We also hosted some short-term adult visitors from the former Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to get the names of the countries wrong if I try and... I think it was Kazakhstan. And... Was it Uzbekistan or Tajikistan? One of the stands. Uh, yeah. But they were no just there meant. for a few weeks, <laughs> for a week or so. Yeah. And then I would just help them get to where they needed to go for their program. That's all. We also had the opportunity to send our daughter on a foreign exchange program overseas for three weeks uh, to Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. We also had uh, the highlight our twentieth year and our twenty year anniversary present to ourselves was to take a cruise in the Caribbean, and we thought that we were big travelers again because well we had to renew our passports in order to, to leave the country. So we had these uh, new passports, which were totally blank. Well, I guess God knows what he's doing better than we do. <laughs> but if we're looking at uh, a marriage takeaway from that part of our life, uh, again, I would say we were extremely active and busy in, in all the things that we were trying to accomplish professionally and as a family, but we definitely made it a priority to spend time together uh, in God's word uh, as much as we could every day. In, in spite of all those efforts that you put into maintaining your marriage and keeping things going, marriage continues to change. And one of the biggest changes I think that couples in our uh, stage of life face is when the nest empties. And that's what happened to us. Our oldest daughter graduated from high school, went on to college, and the younger daughter was in her just about to begin her senior year when I received another call to serve our church's mission in Malawi. So let's talk a little bit about that, that move. We had a lot of loose ends to tie up to get out of the country. I received the call and accepted it in the fall of 2016, but then it was like another seven months after that before we actually left. What are some of the things that you remember about those that last uh, 
was last the last part of our time in Alabama? Well, I would say that we knew where we were going better than the kids actually did, because one was deciding where to go to university, could be Massachusetts or Wisconsin or where, and I think she really didn't settle until late March, and we were we were in Malawi already by late June, and the other one was staying in Alabama, but she had to get accepted to a program, and then she found out in May that she wanted to transfer to a different program, but she wouldn't move, but at least she knew what she wanted to study for the next three years. So that was kind of, whew, good. I'm glad you know that. You only have a couple more weeks to finalize that before we move. And then she moved out Mother's Day weekend, and we moved Memorial Day weekend a few weeks later, and we took the other child, and then we were trying to settle into Wisconsin because now we knew that Chrissy would be in Wisconsin. We had to uh, sell our house again. And how many uh, yard sales did we have? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I think by October, November, we were putting things that we knew we wouldn't use in the garage and then I went on Facebook Messenger and started re getting people to look at it and to come and we sold our bed frame even pretty early but we had a mattress it just seems wrong to say this all but yeah we put in a new carpet and by January it was on the market and March we had sold it and we had to move out to a rental for a few months I gotta be honest, it was hard for me to give up the bikes and the lawnmower. Yeah, okay. I, I really enjoyed that aspect of living in the uh, suburbia, but well, you have to say no to one thing, you can say yes to something else, right? Yeah, and it was interesting, you know, our kids were almost on the verge they could have used furniture, but they couldn't. You know, they were in university, so even our cats had to just go live with someone else too because our kids could not have taken them in the meantime yeah we moved in stages so we and we emptied the house of the belongings did a little bit of remodeling sold the house and then moved into a rental and then we lived there i don't know what about three months three or four months no no it was longer than no, that it was really march to me yeah it was only three months and that was a nice little neighborhood that we lived in but again it was didn't really feel like it was, per se, our home. It just was a place to live, to hang our hat. Finish school, and then then your your dad passed away. Want to talk about that? Well, really, about the same time we knew we were going to Africa, he, he seemed to be failing, and I was able to visit him two times before the final time I saw him. You know, in the last week of his life, we were already back in Wisconsin, moved. So it was, I think it was a good time. I mean, I was appreciative that I got to see him. And, you know, a few of those times, he nothing seemed wrong. He seemed fine, but he really did fail in the winter. And then by spring, he was in hospice and he died in June. And we were able to be with family and just reflect on the message that, you know, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And be with family and church and encourage other family members. Well, we were able to, we were, we were, we were close definitely by. close enough that we could come and visit him. And we were on, uh, we were night duty one night close to the end there. And then the funeral uh, was held in the same church where we were married, and a lot of old friends, former teachers that we had had in high school came to the funeral to pay their respects, and, and in some ways it was a, a, an affirmation for us to know that, you know, we had somebody watching our back, that there was a, that there's a sense of community that uh, we belonged to, even though we were getting ready to leave it, I, I think that was a good thing. And and really, during those last uh, few weeks uh, before we left for Africa, we did spend quite a bit of time in churches with family members, didn't we? Going all, 
all kinds of special services that were were offered. Well, we arrived in Malawi in June of 2017. And of course we had to get adjusted to some pretty significant changes. Um, empty nest being probably the biggest one, but some other things as well. Uh, as comparison to the life that you have for the most part in the United States, uh, when you live as an expat, uh, you pretty much stand out in a crowd. And I've talked about this in some other episodes, so I don't want to get into it now. But um, I think for both of us, it was difficult to get used to the fact of having people always around on the campus, the domestic workers, never really having complete privacy. Uh, even though there's these huge six, seven foot high walls around everybody's yards. Um, one thing that, one of your personal bugaboos is when people talk about, uh, how's your adventure going in Africa? You want to explain why that word grates on you? Well, that was even before arriving in Malawi, people would say, oh, what an adventure. But I think because I've been through Bulgaria, and having to leave another country and then come back to the United States already and leave family and even leave the kids now, it just didn't really smack of an adventure. It felt a little painful. Yeah, was, this, this second tour that we've done overseas has been much more difficult than the first one uh, when we were just fresh out of uh, seminary. And another big part of it is because it's a challenge raising kids when you live 8,000 miles away from them. Even though they are young adults, they still do uh, appreciate and even require our support and guidance. Uh, since we've been here in Malawi, we've lived at four different addresses in about three and a half years. <laughs> Notice a recurring theme here in our marriage. Yeah, it's going to be the second Christmas in a row at the same place, which is great. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I don't know about you, Nancy, but I think that uh, we're turning into our parents. I get that feeling sometimes, or maybe like our grandparents, if we just skip a generation. You know, we're still working at keeping our marriage alive and fresh. I think that after 27 years, maybe we're finally starting to figure this thing out or maybe I'm not because <laughs> the minute you take it for granted right the minute it becomes like an old shoe that's when it goes off the rails so let's talk a little bit about how COVID has affected our lives and our marriage it is such a huge issue for so many people and their relationships today I would say for me COVID hasn't really affected my work schedule too much even before the lockdowns began, um, I was relying on Zoom and uh, other remote meetings with people because we work with uh, our partners across so many different countries. But you, during this COVID time, have been busy working on a project uh, to digitize a German language Sunday school handle. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've had this project kind of in the back of my mind through the years, but I guess I finally had the time. I had photocopied a 1903 songbook my grandfather had used and it had his name in it and some notes. And I digitized it and put in the music in electronic format and trying to think about what if I could encourage people to... Uh, create Bible-based songs and use them. So it's still a work in project. And, but it, it did fill the gap because a lot of my community projects and involvements got put on hold during COVID. Yeah, for about six months, we didn't leave the long way. Even though there wasn't any official... Uh, restrictions on travel out in, within the country. We, of course, we couldn't travel outside the country. Uh, the airports were shut down. But, um, yeah, it's been it's been nice to have the, the borders open up again. But still, things aren't back to the way they were before. Not quite yet. But we were able to 
stay in touch with people through technology, worship online. Some weeks church was even canceled, but we've been back for quite a while now too with mass. So again, if we're looking for some takeaway for our marriage during this uh, ongoing phase of, of our lives, we know that uh, life changes, but God's promises never change. And his plan is that two people remain married for life. And that plan has, is, is really what has kept us not only together, but has kept our marriage alive and thriving. So, yeah, I want to thank you for being with me today in our home studio here. And uh, is there any final words that, of wisdom that you'd like to share about uh, marriage that you've learned from the years that we've traveled all over the world? Well, I do appreciate this Bible passage. You have made known to me the path of life. Oh Lord, you will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Um, I chose this in 1990 as a Bible passage that I've been seeing daily because it's displayed in artwork. And it's been interesting how even before being married, it's been a good thing to remember that the path of life keeps going forward with God's help. And now, especially being married and having our children scattered and we ourselves scattered again away from our parents, that God's with us and we have hope and joy. And that Bible passage is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 16, verse 11. Well, next time on uh, Home Ties, I'm hoping to be able to get my daughter uh, in the studio with me to talk a little bit about what... Uh, her perspective has been on all the different moves that we've done over the years, moving uh, overseas, leaving her behind when we moved. And uh, the fun thing of it is, is she's actually here in Africa with us uh, for the next month and a half. Uh, so we'll hopefully be able to pick her brain and learn some things from her and have fun in next week's episode. So until then, God bless. We'll see you next time.